Good afternoon, everyone. Um, it's a, a pleasure to be here. Imagine with me, if you will, the things that make you happy, the things that bring the greatest amount of joy into your life, and the people and experiences that you cherish the most. Maybe it's your family and waking up next to your loved ones, or seeing a smile just go across your, your son or your daughter's face. Maybe it's fly fishing for trout in the mountains and actually hooking into one. Or maybe it's watching a sunset during your long weekend at the lake. For some of you, maybe it's looking up the, at the stars on a crystal clear night and thinking about the size of the universe and, and why we're all here. Or maybe for some of you, it's much more simple than that. And maybe it's looking at the fall colors when they're at their fullest and appreciating that. Whatever it is that makes you happy, think about that. Now imagine waking up and opening your eyes to darkness. Imagine losing the ability to see the people that mean the most to you and the ability to do the things that you enjoy the most with your life. Beyond that, think about the difficulties and the challenges that you would face in getting through everyday life and getting to work would you be able to perform the duties of your work? Could you provide for your family? What would you do? Blindness is a major component of human suffering. There are 45 million people in this world that are blind in both eyes. Remarkably, four out of five of these people have a curable form of blindness. That is 80% have a form of blindness that we currently have the knowledge or the technology to fix or prevent. For the purposes of this talk, I'm going to focus specifically on cataract blindness, and cataract blindness makes up about half of all the blindness in the world. A cataract is a natural progression or clouding of the lens that progresses with advancing age. Left untreated, cataracts can result in severe visual impairment, as you can see in the simulation behind me. And they can even result in blindness. Now, 90% of blindness in the developing world is, sorry, 90% of the blindness in the world is in the developing world, and rates are highest in Sub-Saharan Africa, Asia, and the South Pacific. There are many barriers to care in these areas, and that's why the majority of, of blindness is in the developing world. The major barrier is access to care. Now, it's pretty unusual for somebody in the United States to end up blind from cataracts, and that's because we have great access to care. There's one ophthalmologist or one eye surgeon for every 20,000 people here in the United States. It is a completely different story in places like Sub-Saharan Africa, where there is one ophthalmologist for every six million people in the most remote areas. As a result, people end up with cataracts that don't just limit their ability to drive, they're cataracts that result in complete blindness, like that pictured behind me. There are 20 million people who live in the poorest and most remote areas of the world who are blinded from cataracts like this. I was a medical student, a third year medical student actually, when I became aware of these statistics and something about them resonated within me. They appealed to me. I sat around and I, and I, I thought, how can I do nothing about that? Knowing this, how can I do nothing about this problem? It was about this time when I ran into this book uh, by Dr. Jeffrey Tabin, who is a major influence in my life called Blind Corners. And this is a book about his adventurous life and his quest to cure blindness in the most remote and poor regions of the world and how they overcame these barriers to do so successfully. And so naturally I was inspired by this, his work and, and I searched him down on the internet and I called uh, Dr. Tabin and I said, hey, I'd like to come out and visit you in Nepal. And naturally, um, and right away he agreed to have me along and three months later I was on a plane uh, traveling to Nepal. I visited the Tilganga Institute of Ophthalmology, which is pictured here, and this is a world-class eye care delivery system in one of the poorest countries in the world. And I was awestruck not only by the skillfulness and, and quality, the skillfulness of the surgeons and the quality of the care and the efficiency with which they were able to provide it, but the most striking thing about this place is every person who walked through the doors received the care that they needed regardless of their ability to pay. No matter how poor they were, if they walked through the doors and they needed something, they got it, and that was, to me, very striking. <laughs> And it's because of the genius of the, the man pictured here, Dr. Sanduk Ruit, who may go on someday to win the Nobel Prize, but this man has arguably done more 
uh, to cure blindness and develop sustainable systems of eye care delivery than anyone else in the entire world. And he's partnered up with Dr. Jeff Tabin to, to found the Himalayan Cataract Project. So I had the pleasure of working uh, with Dr. Rui as a medical student for a few weeks, and so I, of course, was picking his brain constantly, trying to figure out what it is. How did you make this system work in an area that's so poor? How were you able to provide care to so many patients and people in an economically viable and sustainable way? And so through my observations and my discussion with Dr. Rui, I, I found, I discovered the principles that make this system work. And these are really applicable to any business or any healthcare system. And we really have a lot to learn about from these guys and, and from this system here in the US. And the, the principles were very simple. The, the successes of the hospital were, f the foundation of the success was based on quality care. If you have a quality product, the quality product will drive demand for the product. And the, Physicians also practiced with, a, with an efficiency that allowed them to see a very high volume of patients, and that volume met the demand, but it also lowered the unit cost per patient. And that just follows a simple rule of economy of scale. They also introduced a tiered pricing system that made care available to everyone. The people who could afford to pay for care paid for their care, but they also subsidized the care for other people. In fact, 50% of people who walked through the door paid little or nothing for the services. So I thought, well, the people in, in Kathmandu, in the, in the capital city where Tilgong is located, those people are fine. And um, they're going to receive world-class eye care at a very affordable price. But what about all the people who live in the mountainous, roadless regions of Nepal? There's millions of people who live there and tens of thousands of people who are blind. What have they done for these people? And so I asked Dr. Rui, and he said, come along with me. Let's go to a remote village, and let's do one of our surgical outreaches. And so we hopped on a plane. It was a twin-engine plane, and we flew in what was definitely the, the scariest flight of my life over the Himalaya. And we came down at a really steep approach. We landed on this gravel runway in this village, and the village is um, named Fatplu. And it's a, it's a village in, at the, in the foothills of the Himalaya near Mount Everest. And it was here that I really saw the, the incredible impact of blindness. I was able to see how these people lived, how they farmed, and how they worked, and the environment in which they lived. And it really gave me a good sense of the, the enormous impact of blindness. Now, blindness robs people of their dignity, their integrity. It robs people of their happiness and their emotion and their independence. And these people are simply, they're not providers and they're non-productive members of society. And as such, they're put on a shelf. In fact, the word for blindness in Nepali literally translates to a mouth with no hands. And so that gives you a sense of how these people are looked at by, by their culture and even their families. But blindness extends beyond the person. It, it extends and it sort of has a ripple effect and it, it impacts the family and the community in a great way. In fact, there's at least one provider in every household with a blind person that's pulled out of a productive uh, role, it, whether that's working or farming, because a lot of these cultures are subsistence farmers, um, and that has a staggering economic impact on a global scale. And so it extends just beyond the patient. The psychological impacts of blindness are, are deep and powerful as well. Almost every patient who's blind has some form of depression. Some are severely depressed, and a lot of these patients are sort of shells of their former selves in the most severe form. They're lifeless, sort of have this blunted emotional capacity, and they're just sort of shells. And it was very depressing to see that. Because of no, the, the lack of resources in the developing world, life expectancy is about a third of age-matched peers in the developing world. So there is some impact on mortality as well. Life expectancy of a child in, is much worse, and children usually only live a year or two with blindness in this setting. So I learned a great deal about the impact of blindness in the developing world during that week. But we also screened hundreds of patients, and we identified several patients, probably about 150 or 200 patients, who were blind. And the majority of patients had blindness related to cataracts. And this was the typical type of cataract. You can imagine looking through this lens and trying to make your way around the house or the field or trying to say it's impossible. So these people really, their, their life had been taken away from them over the course of time. Thanks to the innovative work of Dr. Rui, cataract surgery is something that now we can take anywhere in the world. We can take it to the poorest and most remote regions. You really just need a few things. You need 
of course, a surgeon. You need a microscope, which is portable. You need a few simple instruments. You need cataracts, and you need an intraocular lens. And you have those things, and, and you really can do surgery anywhere in the world. So we gathered up these, this group of patients, um, and I was sort of helping clean them off and prepare them for surgery. And you anesthetize them, so you give them some numbing medicine behind their eyes so they can't feel anything. And you drape them, and you get the eyelid speculum in the eye. And then you perform this very delicate and elegant surgery. And what you do is you make a small incision in the eye, and you actually unwrap the cataract. You unwrap it from its little candy shell, the capsule, and you lift it up into the front part of the eye, and you deliver it out through a very small incision. And this is a picture of the lens here. And then the next step is to insert an intraocular lens. And the intraocular lens allows patients to see. It focuses light on the retina, and it allows them to see well without glasses postoperatively, which, again, is a big deal, because in the developing world, people don't have access to glasses either. So after the surgery, which in the best of hands, Dr. Ruiz is a very skilled surgeon. You can do the surgery in about three to five minutes. So you're taking out a cataract, putting a new lens, in three to five minutes it happens. You put a patch and shield on the patient, and the patient goes to the recovery area um, where they generally spend the night. And then the next day is, this is what makes this type of work addictive. This is where you get addicted. The next day they come to the examining area, wherever it may be, and you take the shield off, and you instantly see this sort of look of amazement and wonder and appreciation and joy and happiness. You see this person sort of fill back up with life, and you can see it on their face, and they're laughing and smiling, and you can imagine people are seeing for the first time in maybe 10 or 20 years. So it is a very, it's a magical, miraculous moment. The emotional transformation is amazing as well. You, in the best analogy that I can come up with is you take a plant. Everybody has a plant that's been in the back corner and it's shriveled. It's just about ready to die. And you, you save it just before it's about ready to die. You put it on your table. You give it some water. You put it in sunlight. You maybe give it a little fertilizer. And then you walk back in the room two, three days later and it's, it doesn't even look like the same plant. You can't believe it's the same plant. It's sort of bloomed back to life. And that's what happens with these patients. They instantly come back to life. So over the course of the week, people were dancing and, and crying and laughing. Some of these people seeing their family members for the first time in, in a long time, or their kids maybe that they had never seen. And they're praying, and the best part about this all is that you can give this gift to somebody. The hard cost of this, as I had come to find out through the course of the week, was $20. Can't think of a better way to spend $20. And <clears throat> I was amazed by the whole process and relieved that I had found something like this. I knew that I would be, I was, I was attached to this for the, for the rest of my life. I knew that I would continue to be involved um, with this. And I imagined a life spent doing this type of work is a life well spent, a career well spent. And so I, fast forwarding a little bit, I finished up medical school and I spent the next five years um, of my ophthalmology training, pursuing opportunities for continued engagement to continue this type of work, which culminated with a one-year fellowship, which was the first of its kind at the University of Utah with Dr. Jeff Tabin. And we spent the year traveling around doing this type of work for an entire year, my wife and I. All the while in the back of our head, we were thinking about how can we continue this work? We're gonna start a family. We're gonna, we knew we were coming to Omaha. How can we continue this work? How can we make the biggest impact in global blindness? And our answer was the development of the uh, Division of Global Blindness Prevention at UNMC here in town. And our vision for this is very, very simple and straightforward. We have a four-pronged approach. We teach and we host ophthalmologists from all over the world and we teach them both at UNMC and at Midwest Eye Care where I also work. Um, we teach them better ways of taking care of their patients. We also travel to the, the institutions in which they work, and we teach them there in the setting of limited resources because we think that's very important. Um, we cure. We do multiple outreach trips a year. Um, we work in Haiti, Nepal, Ethiopia, and Ghana, where we per, uh, perform sight-restoring cataract surgeries. And we partner with different non uh, nonprofit organizations, such as the Himalayan Cataract Project, Orbis International, International Eye Foundation, and we allow them, we bring them in because what they do best is work on plans of sustainable development. And so we allow them uh, to come in and, and they help us with that. 
And the most important thing that we do in the final prong of our sort of uh, vision is we offer opportunities for global engagement for medical students, for residents, for faculty members, for fellows, really for anybody in the community, eye care providers in the community, anyone who wants to get involved. If you want to get involved, we can find a way to get you involved in this type of work. Which brings me to my closing thoughts. For a long time, I thought the greatest gift that I could give someone was the gift of sight. But I now realize that the greatest gift that I can give someone is the opportunity to, to engage in that which I'm so passionate about. Because the impact of influence is exponential. So I encourage you all to think about this question over the course of the next couple days and think about how you can use your passion to influence other people around you to make the world a better place. Thank you very much.